Don't you try and start the episode before it started. I know your game. There we are. What? Hello. Oh, now you can what? start the episode. Do you know what? I had someone who said to me the other day, one of the listeners, why they love listening to us. Do you want to know why? Why? Because they said they feel like they're in the room with us. They say every other podcast they listen to is so scripted and so all about the learning that it's actually like they learn more from us because they're more engaged because they feel like they're in the room. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That should be part of this yeah, episode. We- I think we're going to keep it in the episode. Well, I am recording. I hope you are too. Okay. So there you have it. You heard it here from our listeners. Listen, the best listeners in the world. Welcome to Women Your Mother Warned You About, brought to you by you Sales warned. Gravy. You were <laughs> warned. I'm Gina Tremarco, one of your co-hosts. And I'm Susanna Gray Jones, <laughs> the co-host. <laughs> um, and I am a recruitment strategist and owner of Chime. So should I totally just cut into your introduction there? I don't care. It's really rude. It's all good. It doesn't bother me. Hey, I mean... That is the beauty of this show that we have that. I love getting that feedback. I want people to feel like they're in the room with us and it's not just so scripted and you don't know what's going to come out of our mouths. Sometimes I wish that all of our guests, I won't name any, but (laughs) not every single guest falls into line with our style of just like rolling with it. Being weird. Yeah, I guess you could call it being weird or I just like to call it being real. This this is what this show is based on, is being real and raw and relevant. What a great reminder. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's what we aim to do. And sometimes a little irreverent, um, probably me so than I'm probably more irreverent than you are. I know we we're sending voice notes to each other today. My husband is so funny because he's got to hijack my voice notes now when he knows. Cause I'll be like, shh, 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 I gotta, I gotta send a note to Susanna. And he like is standing there ready to hijack and jump in with a message. And so he should. And that's the thing again, I'd like to say that I love about um, this podcast and how I feel about the listeners is we're all inclusive, right? So Anyone who wants to join in, just join in. And it does feel like that. You know, I've learned quite a lot recently about not Americans, maybe a bit about Americans. You kind of have this sort of girls club kind of thing. Fit in. You've got to clique here. You've got to be proper. You've got to be a certain way. You've got to be in this society. You've got to be in that society. Would you know what? Everyone's part of my society. I don't know about you. <laughs> yeah, I think that's why you and I get along so well. And eventually we'll make our way to um, a topic. but. I don't know if you relate to this, but, you know, growing up in high school, like, well, A, I went to two different high schools and I went to three different grade schools. And I think that moving around in schools made me less likely to be part of a clique or part of one clique. Like I was part of all the cliques. Like I hung out with the cool people and I hung out with the nerds and I hung out with the theater people. And I like I hung out with everybody, but I didn't have like one real home. Does that make sense? How often did you move around when you were in school? Well, I mean, like I went to two different high schools. Yeah. So I had two sets of friends and that's a whole funny story in itself about why I went to two different high schools, but I changed high schools because of a boyfriend, but that's another story for another time. Maybe I'll put that in my book. And then grade school wise, we moved, which put us into a different grade school, But before we moved, we actually went, we changed schools from a public school to a Catholic school because our public school wasn't so great. So basically two schools in one neighborhood and then one school in the next neighborhood and then two high schools and then two colleges. So I changed, like I bounced around, I bounced around. But what that did for me was help me create all kinds of friends and be able to get along with a variety of people. I just never felt like I had one place to hang my hat. Does that make sense? I think it makes perfect sense. And I think it could explain why you're good at sales, but also how much of that do you think is part of you opposed to the moving around? Because you, you've always talked about how you're, you're quite a curious person, right? And I think I'm the same, right? 
Yeah. So if you're sat having dinner with someone who is supposedly boring, a lot of people say that if you find that person boring, that makes you the boring person. Mm-hmm. And I yeah. actually agree with that philosophy. Yeah, I agree. Which might make me boring. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it is, part of it is me. And and I kind of alluded, started to allude to this, or at least maybe alluded to myself in my book that I'm currently writing. Yay! A big aha that I had was, or have had had in writing is that because, you know, my dad had me working in a flea market at such a young age, you know, like age 10, being around adults all the time in a kind of a business capacity, a selling capacity. Um, When you're around adults that much at that age, I think that had a lot of impact on who I became as a teenager and as an adult. I think that shaped a lot. I just, I just, I think saw things differently. Mm. Adapted differently. You were, I think you were kind of born into a life where you were around lots of people, right? You know, yeah. that whole sort of extrovert and introvert thing. Yeah. When we, when we had that episode, you actually decided that maybe you were an introvert, but it could be that you've just been around people a lot of your life that it's made you more extrovert, maybe. Well, and I, I think, I, I think I'm probably most likely more of an ambivert. I go, <laughs> I go both ways. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, what we believe, how we believe and define ourselves often affects the way that we are, you know, and we, we know this, but like, I, I still feel from when I was at school and I've been writing a lot about this recently because I've been invited to do an interview um, with this, this company. And I, I talked a lot about special needs, right? So I had dyslexia and dyspraxia at school. I speak about that a lot, but it made me decide in my head, I am just a bit thick. And I play up to that because in my head, that story, it works. It makes sense. It's a learned pattern. Um, and we learn, we learn patterns from our childhood, don't we? So mm-hmm. yeah, I, it makes so much sense when I speak to you about the whole flea market thing and, you know, how you had uh, hustled and your dad was there sort of cheering you on. I can see that in how you are today. Completely. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. I've got a question for you. Oh boy. <laughs> I've done a question for you. So this is the episode that I think we're doing that is closest to Christmas. Yeah, this is um this is three days till Christmas. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you a question. If you had, let's pretend you're gonna have a Christmas gift, right? Mm-hmm. That takes the place in a form of some kind of magical sales skill that you can use next year. Or maybe something that you've picked up this year that you're going to use for next year. What would that one thing be? And that's rogue. So you've got to think on your feet here, girl. You think on your feet. Yeah, I did not. I did not see that coming. If I could (laughs) have a, I'm just going to go with my gut reaction. My gut instinct is I would get to know as fast as I could, meaning N-O. That would be the superpower that I would have because I know that this year I've had several deals that I was working that required a lot of consensus or a lot of stakeholders or, I mean, those are harder ones, but I've also had some deals that I just got, I just, I I actually read the email to you that I'm like, I put so much time into certain deals thinking that they were going to go through. And they just kind of pulled me along for the ride. And I did not get the yes, your vendor of choice answer when I should have. And I let it go too long. And and what I've learned is that I have such limited time because I'm working my pipeline, because I actually have to deliver on the, what we sell. I don't have a lot of free time. And I have to, I really, that's the gift I want. I want to know how to get to you. I want to get better at getting to a no quicker without being hasty about it. Yeah. And without being, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, hasty. And I don't want to be, ju- I don't want to fall into a pattern of judgmental profiling of like, oh, this one, I already can tell it's going to take too long. So let me get out of this. Like, I don't want to project that. So yeah. That's the first thing that comes to mind. If I, if you gave me a really good gift of sales skills, that that's what it would be. What a great, like, I think you, 
you've preached this to me before, so I know that it's something that you you've known. But I think you've had a bit of an aha moment, haven't you? Like with this, and mm-hmm. yeah. um, you were saying like today you kind of had a ah, you know what? Yeah, time, time and deals, and it is so true. Even in recruitment, like by asking the right questions and putting people into scenarios, you get past that whole like, what are you looking for? What would you rather have? You know, but actually asking powerful questions. You know, we talk a lot about yes, no questions and all of that, but this is like adding another layer to it, like giving them uh, a question of how would you feel if you walked in tomorrow and you start this job? What would you need that salary to look like? All those types of questions, really, really crucial. Well, what's the gift you would? What about you? (laughs) It's so funny. It's like almost the reverse of what yours is. (laughs) Mine is, mine is, I have, I've had a few you know this, and it's not something that I'm really putting out there. I'm not someone who publicizes this, but I'm about to say it on the podcast. I've been pretty ill the last few weeks yeah, to the point that I have been rushed to hospital. And it's kind of given me a, a few... couple of times you've been rushed to hospital. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not dying. We don't think. But anyway, <laughs> um, to, not to be morbid, but I, I had a few moments where I just thought, you know what? I've got to start saying no to other people. I have always been a yes person. I want to be the best mum. I want to be the best wife. I want to be, um, at one point this year, I had about four different jobs that I could have done full, t- full time. <laughs> and I didn't even realize until I stopped. I was like, ah, oh, okay. Yeah. You can't do four jobs because you're just getting ill all the time. Yep. And I think allowing time to be lazy, right? Like allowing time to be lazy. Take a bed day. Why not? And you're more likely to be disciplined on those days. By yourself, by the way. Yeah. By yeah. yourself without being a mom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, we have nursery for that. So we're okay. But yeah. And it's, you know, you do, you always talk about being creative. And I am, um, you did that bath water experience, didn't you, when you were in right. Atlanta? Yes. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, yeah. Uh, because I thought I was going to buy that for my husband as a Christmas gift. I hope he doesn't listen to this episode. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Make him listen to it after Christmas. But, <laughs> but you know, when you told me, oh, Susanna, come along and do this, I was like, oh, really? What would I do for all that time? So it kind of made me think if you, if you're struggling to, if you find that boring time on your own, then you need time on your own. If you think you're too busy to have time on your own, then you need time on your own. So that is my aha moment. Mm, I love it. As long as you don't say no to me. Never. Never. Yeah. You've been. I mean, I you know, I show up, don't I? I'm inspired. Every every episode we do, I'm inspired. <laughs> I think but, that's yeah. I think that's good. You have to. Uh, it's taken me a while to learn how to say say no, and I'm I'm still working on it. But I do. I take a lazy day. I I have to. I can't. I don't always get them either. Like I don't think I'll have. Um, I might have one this weekend, but I don't think I will. There's just too much stuff going on, but. I was at a state on the West Coast in Washington State last week, and that took up my whole week. And it was a lot of travel to get from the East Coast to the West Coast. So it's, you know, a full day here, a full day there. And then there was a snowstorm and I didn't know if I was going to make it back. And I had to come back to a full day of training and coaching and meetings and, you know, I had an aha with that too. I like told Mary in our office, I'm like, I... I am going to choose to not, even if it means losing money out of my pocket, I'm going to choose not to roll back in from a trip um, with with a full schedule the next day because there was a chance I wasn't going to make it back because of a snowstorm. And that kind of stuff is going to happen. And I've seen that more often this year than I ever have. Snowstorm, um, rain, rainstorm, whatever, you know, plane breaks down. The reality is... Um, there's been more chances of like flights not getting in and whatnot that the stress isn't worth it. And you're not going to be productive in your, in your life if you're trying to, to stuff everything into your calendar, it's just not going to be effective because somewhere along the line, something is going to break down. So, I mean, what is your thought on overpacking your day, trying to get everything done. Obviously, you're going to start ch- saying no more, but what is your what are your thoughts on like the efficiency when you're trying to do everything 
on your calendar? Well, I think you can't put everyone in the same box, right? I think we're all different. So some people are more resilient than others. Like we know, for example, Jeb Blount, he packs probably some days. I just don't know how he does. He flies back in, he goes straight into the office. I don't have that stamina. So I think there's something about knowing your stamina, knowing your shine points. Do you ever have those days where you're just like, Gina is on fire today? Well, I, I, I do. And they don't come every day. I don't think anyone has days like that every day. So my, what I think about that is when you do have those days, maximize them and then have a day where you just chill and gradually you'll start to have more days where you're just on fire. And sometimes being good enough is okay. A lot of us are perfectionists and we want to be the best and sometimes good enough. Yep. Be good enough. That is a really good point. Um, I, I do have days where I'm totally on fire where I'm like, man, I am killing everything I do today. Like I'm really good. Um, I also know how important it is to have a really good team. So, you know, I think you know, Jeb's got an amazing team around him and he can be all over the place because he does have a really good team. I'm part of that team. Um, I don't have as much team as he has per se, uh, but just knowing that I have people in my life that can help with things, pick up things, you know, pick up for me, like as far as filling in the blanks of things that I can't take care of. Um, my husband is a really great partner. Yeah. So like just having, you know, if I'm having a super full busy day, which is most days, and it happens to be the day he's not working, um, he will do everything to provide for me in the day from feeding me to um, picking up prescriptions for me to doing things to make me more productive. So I think you can do a lot if you've got resources yes. to help you. Um, but if you try to do everything yourself and you try to like run super hard, you will burn out. Yes. And many people don't even like to admit that they burnt out. One thing that I think we both do quite well and that I think I encourage all the listeners to do is to speak to someone if you're having a bad day. Like you and me, mm -hmm. we're, we, we're not negative, but we will have the odd whinge. You know, we'll have a big, uh, yeah. and then you feel better again and you lift yourself up again. I yeah. What did you call? We'll have the what? Whinge? whinge. Do what you guys not have whinging? Whinge. What is the, what is the, how do you spell that? W-H-I-N-G-E. I see. I, I think that's an American word too. I think you're uh Whinge? Whinge. So spell it one more time. W-H-I-N-G-E. You know, like whining, whinge. whining, like, oh. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like whining, whining with a G. Another English lesson for, for the Americans. Okay, another <laughs> English lesson. There we go. Yeah. You, yeah, I think you have to have the whinge. Um, I also, um, Lately, I've chosen to not whinge <laughs> as much. Um, I think I picked some of that up in Jeb's newest book in Selling in a Crisis. Like, yeah. And I've picked it up from my own coach. Yeah. Like, I, I believe in venting and getting things out of your system, but it has to be super limited. Yeah. Because if you, if you spend too much time on it, you are actually putting too much attention on it, on the negativity. Yeah. Which which is really counterproductive. So things that I don't like or I don't agree with, I just don't get involved with. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think also when we are whinging, sometimes be be mindful who you're whinging to and what kind of impact it will have on oh. them. Because oh, yeah. we we have drainers and we have people who uplift you, and that's one thing I think. Energy that you carry around is so important. I don't believe yeah. that you either have. A draining energy or an uplifting energy, I think that you can control the energy that you put out there into the world. I really do. And a lot of that comes from breathing, the way we breathe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this yeah. as a performer, you know, the art of deep breath and the, yeah. the way our voices sound is often a reflection of who we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I always think of this because my singing teacher, she used to just lie me on the floor and she used to press on my stomach. And say, now breathe. Now breathe. You, you're forced to take a deep breath, and suddenly you'll be like, I don't feel stressed anymore. I feel okay. I do that a lot where I'll just breathe in and I'll breathe out, and it'll sound like a heavy sigh. And people have said to me, like, Are you okay? And I'm like, Because they'll be like, You just made this really big sigh. And I'm like, No, I'm just breathing, like, I'm breathing in positive energy and breathing out negative energy. And I do that when I meditate too. Yeah. Like, my meditation is always like, 
is I breathe in positive word, breathe out negative word. Yeah. And then I changed it. And now I just breathe in positive word, but I don't breathe out any words. Yeah. Like it just helps center me into staying in that positive space. Definitely. Definitely. One thing our friend um, Heather Monaghan talks about is running towards fear as well, like running towards fear. That had quite an impact on me because anything that we're afraid of, we always naturally think about running away and escaping in amygdala, but actually think about running towards it and being bigger than the fear itself. Yeah. You know, if you can breathe in that strength, then you're adding another extra layer to that power. And so many people live in fear, fear of what might happen if they had that conversation that could actually just break the ice or fear of turning up because they're worried they might make a mistake. It, if, if only we could stop the world being fearful, right? Think of what we could accomplish. There's so much that we could accomplish. Yeah, well, I think fear is always going to be there because of that amygdala. It's not, it's not going anywhere. How do, you get over, how do you get over your fear? And what are you, you know, you, you go into these sales meetings on a daily basis. And we both are hunting on a daily basis. You pick up that phone. You're like, Ugh. we get that fear. What's going to happen? What do you do? What's your voice? How do you, how do you interrupt, mm. disrupt that amygdala? I think for me, if I were to like self-reflect, for me, it's always about coming towards people with such a joy and happiness and fun. Yeah that that disrupts them. And and I'm saying that because I just noticed this about myself over the weekend, which I meant like it's on my list of blog articles to write. So every year I, I volunteer for a charity event. It's a, it's a golf outing that raises money for a local charity. And I work this event every year and they put me in the same position every year. They put me in the position of selling raffle tickets. Yeah. And it's raffle tickets, you know, for all these prizes. And they put me in that position because of my sales skills. Yeah. And um, this year I doubled how much money I raised selling raffle tickets. And there I am. And, and I'd just done this trip to Washington State and back. I was exhausted. Even David's like, why are you getting up so early when like you just got back? And I'm like, I committed to it and I wanted to stick to it because I need the balance in my life, even though it's wiped out. But I noticed that every time, like, right, they, these golfers, they, they check in and they check in for all the stuff that they got to pick up. I'm not a golfer, so they can purchase a mulligan. I'm not going to explain it because I don't really understand it. And then after they've registered and pick, pay for a mulligan, if they want mulligans, they can buy these raffle tickets. So there's like this, like a, like this conveyor belt kind of situation. And so they get to me, but before they even get to me, I'm like literally big as life, hands in the air going, bring it in. Come on. It's just 20 more dollars. Open your wallet. And every time they would approach, I would have a different way of greeting them. And so you're selling them these raffle tickets, right? So they're in these rolls and it's like they can buy an arm's length, which I'm going to demonstrate. It's like from my elbow, from my shoulder to the end of my fingers, right? That's an arm's length. Or they can buy a wingspan, right? So fingertip to fingertip. But we would always do more than that. But the way we would do it, now keep in mind, they're mostly men. And I was definitely inappropriate, I'm sure. But I had every different saying I could say, right? To like make them laugh, in some way, like, okay, I'm going to make this really long for you now. And I would like roll out and I'd like just have them laughing and be really big and bold. And even though there was the $20 donation and the $10 donation, I didn't give, I like, I was cracking myself up at my sales skills because I gave nobody the $10 option. What? And there was this, and there was a sign that said $20 wingspan, $10 um, arm's length. And I'm like, okay. $20. And then they look at the sign and they're like, what about the $10 option? I'm like, you don't want the $10 option. <laughs> and I swear only three, three of like a hundred people did not give me $20. And then I convinced them to pay $5 extra for a hug. Ah, 
Of course you did. Such a hustler. <laughs> Such a hustler. <laughs> so how does it how does this cut connect with you being scared or fearful, Laura? Well, because you know, sounds scared. So it, I know it's hard to believe, but all these strangers are about to walk in a room and I have to sell them tickets. And I just hype myself up. Like my skill, I know my skill is comedy. I know that I'm able to make people laugh and I have been able to do so since I was a child. So my way of dealing with fear is putting my comedy mask on. Yeah. So when I see these strangers approaching me and I got to ask them for money, I'm just like, come on, bring it in. Give me your $20, right? And and, and that's how I approach it is I approach fear um, with levity. Interesting. So I always, I've known quite a lot of comedian types um, from the theater in the past. And I'm going to ask you an honest question. Do you use humor to hide sometimes? Oh, sure. Absolutely. See, I only learned this when I was actually in your very first selling with humor um, class, which was really interesting because it actually broke down the different ways that you can actually use humor to sell. Mm hmm. Oh, well, you should see the new, I just revamped it too. You should, you should go watch the newest I one. Will, but no I will, I will. But it, it, yeah. it got me thinking, there's so many people, so many people who are scared. It just makes it so much more fun if they can just find that humor. And I, I sometimes think people who use c comedy are often the most fearful people sometimes. Maybe you're scared, or very scared behind it. And go you for mastering it. Yeah, I mean, some people have different philosophies. I had a coach say to me once, um, she did not stay my coach very long. Um, well, it was her company. It wasn't necessarily the coach that was assigned to me, but she made this comment to me. I know I'm sure someone will hold this against me now, but she made this comment to me that I hide. Well, she said, you hide behind two things, either being a bitch or or being funny. And I said, well, I own a comedy club, so there's that. And she's like, yeah, well, most comedians are insecure people. Well, do you know, you, you have a face sometimes if, if you're like curious. <laughs> you, you have a slight face of like, am I going to be mean? <laughs> but, that, but that was your thoughtful pouting face. And it's like, it's, yeah. it's somewhere between either that I'm super sexy or I'm super mean. <laughs> it's kind of like, it's somewhere between it, but it, you, it's actually quite a powerful tool. And I've seen you use it in quite, quite a good way. <laughs> it sounds like a big mean. All the listeners are going to be like, boo, Susanna, boo, Susanna. But do you know what I mean? I yeah. bet I'm not the first person. Yeah. I mean, I've had some people, you know, I've, I've heard the reference bossy which I used to let that annoy me, but I don't anymore. <laughs> I, I think it goes back to, and I, and I hate getting on the, the women, woman, you know, pedestal thing. But I think, again, as women, we are often, you know, things that are said to us would not be said to men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Like my persona for someone to say, you're so bossy. I've, how often do you hear someone say to a man, you're so bossy? That's a good point. I, I mean, I, I, I would, I'm dying to know for our listeners, for the men out there, if anyone has ever said to you, you're bossy, I would love to hear it. Yeah, that's such a good point. I, it's like women in power. It's very much kind of, there are some women who live, some quite successfully by the philosophy that, the, that a lady should just step aside and not be too confrontational. Mm -hmm. Because if they are, that's not how a lady should behave. And I, uh, that, that goes on and on and on and on. Yeah. In the same way, a woman can be a whore <laughs> and a guy can be a player. Yeah. And oh my gosh, Gina. And I don't know about any of our single listeners, but I'm hearing so many stories about dating at the moment and how horrific oh, it is out there. It's horrific. It's horrific. Lock it your is. husbands up. <laughs> <laughs> it Lock is, them up. <laughs> it's definitely horrific. I definitely want to write the book on how to get past the horror of it all. But yeah, I've got it worse than you. You're a redhead. Um, you know, you, I've, I'm a blonde and there's something about being a blonde because I wasn't always a blonde. And I did, there just a difference when I, you know, changed blonde, even in sales, even when I'm, I've been in meetings and you've got a C suite of a load of men. Sometimes you just sense, you just sense it. It's like they'll make a little joke. 
sort of at your expense and you're supposed to go, <laughs> you know, in a yeah. kind of ditzy way. Well, there, there might be something about the fact that I'm a redhead that I'm considered fiery and bossy. Yes, definitely. Because when I've been told I'm bossy, I'm like, who am I bossing? Nobody reports to me. No. But, you know, if you think something needs to be said, you'll say it. Yeah. So it, it, it comes down to how do you define that word and how do people perceive you? But going back to your original question of like facing your fear, um, I use comedy to face my fear because I think I've been through a lot of tragic situations in my life where the only thing that got me through it was laughing. So I had yeah. to find ways to like, OK, what's funny about this? And and um, since my newest since my I just taught selling with humor recently. And so uh, I provided some new frameworks for the people who took the course because I wanted to make it easier to access the funny. Yes. And the funny really comes down to observation. And when you start to observe everything that happens to you, I guarantee you, you will find funny things in almost everything if you can put a juxtaposition in it, right? Of like, here's this thing that just happened. And then the contrast behind it is where the funny happens. So if you look at, whenever I tell the story about getting anemia and being in the hospital and every time a doctor would come in, like during my transfusion, a doctor, a nurse, anybody, every single time they would walk in. And it was a pretty tragic situation because they said I, I almost flatlined. Every time someone would come in, they would say, um, are you eating leafy greens? Do you get your period? Um, is there blood in your stool? It was like the same three questions. Every, so like, like you're already laughing. It was the same three questions every time. And I'm like, what the, what the? And so I started to do this thing to deal with it because it was so annoying to me because I was so scared. Right. I was in pure fear of like what's happening to me and nobody can explain it. So I just reversed it. I flipped the script. So every time somebody would walk in and it was their first time checking on me or whatever specialist would show up, I would say, OK, before you get started, I <clears throat> eat leafy greens. There's no blood in my stool and I don't have heavy periods. And they would all freeze in their tracks and try not to laugh at me. And they'd be like, uh. Right. But that was my way to cope with it was to this finding the ridiculousness of a situation is a real fast path to finding comedy yeah. and finding humor. Yes. And you can get away with so much, can't you, as well? Like, for example, if I feel that I, I'm working with a recruiter at the moment and I just want them for myself, I don't want them to go to any other recruiters. You can just say, hey, you better not go cheating on me now with any other recruiters. And suddenly they're like laughing. It's like, I'm actually serious. But, yeah. <laughs> and like, but you can't actually say that you're serious, but they laugh and they don't. You know, I'm, that's one thing I'm good at is getting people to be exclusive to me yeah. um, in, in my world. And that is completely by humor. Because if I s stood and said to you, Gina, um, I actually don't want you to work with anyone else, if that's okay. You'll be like, oh my gosh, Susanna, you're so intense. I've got to go work with someone else. You do the opposite. But the minute that you make a joke about it, why is that, do you think? I, I can do it, but I don't know why it works. I think because sometimes, um, oh, and we talk about this in humor too, using comedy in difficult conversations um, is a really good tool because we are uncomfortable with difficult conversations and we are uncomfortable with the potential of disappointing someone or letting someone down. And, and if we can make light of it, right, it's like taking the truth, right? So when we're looking for humor, there's the humor, humor comes from truth, period, end of story or contrast. So the humor just softens a difficult conversation, yeah. right? It's the elephant in the room of the thing you don't want to talk about. Mm -hmm. I mean, you talk about that whole exclusivity. I remember when, when um, I started dating my husband, we had to have that difficult conversation. Like, so, uh, yeah, 
So what do you think? Like, should we date other people? What do you think? <laughs> and, then, and then you just shut up and you back off like, what do you think? And, la- and kind of laugh about it and giggle about it. Because at our age, especially like that's part of the contrast, right? We're in our 50s. It's like, should we go steady? <laughs> oh, it's so true. It makes the awkward conversation easier. And we know that we're having an awkward conversation, but mm-hmm. it doesn't feel as painful when you have when you use levity. Yeah. So what I think you're saying is, first of all, you've got to notice the humor around you every day, right? Oh, yeah. And then, and then it will naturally come to you. And this is this is one thing that I think buys you a lot of friends. You laugh at lots of people's jokes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everyone loves hanging out with a person who laughs at their jokes. Yes, <laughs> yes, Abs- yeah, absolutely. And you can't you can't fake that. You've got to start looking for it. You know, you can't yeah. fake the, the laughing at someone's jokes because otherwise people just get offended. You'd be like, yeah, I would encourage everybody. If you're if you're trying to run after your fear, try to or, you know, we're telling you face your fear, you know, start looking for the funny in it. What's funny about some of the things that you're dealing with? If you if you just really sat down and thought about it. Yeah, that's my suggestion. Life becomes so much easier. And amen, sister, to that. It's entertaining, right? Um, I got this message from this other girl who was volunteering with me and she messaged me. She's like, I just love your energy. Like the energy that I brought to the room because because I actually have volunteer position. Like I've done it for several years, but every year it's like some new people come in and now I'm like the leader of that division, the leader of the raffle tickets. And I'm like, all right, ladies, watch me. This is how we do it. <laughs> uh, Gina on the raffle tickets. <laughs> I guess, I guess, I would guess I was being bossy, but yeah, there you are, guys. There we go. Self disclosure. There we being go. Being bossy. That's <laughs> where. That's where the bossy was. That's where the bossy yeah, was. Only because you're a woman that your yeah, mother won't you about. Exactly. <laughs> but I do want to hear some men tell me if they've been told they were bossy. Yes, I'm gonna put something on LinkedIn. I think I love that. Do it. I will. Yeah. Okay. So It'll we're go. we're a couple of days away from Christmas for those who celebrate Christmas. Um, I'd like to, as we get ready to wrap up the show, you know, what are your I hate New Year's resolutions because I think they're stupid. But what is one thing that you want to focus on? I know we talked about Christmas gift and sales, but what is one intention that you have for 2023 besides you're gonna start saying no more? I think it is to accept failure. Hmm. And that comes down to routine. I am, I, everyone that we speak to is like, how do I get better at time management? How do I get better at time management? And I think the one thing they need to do is to accept failure because when it doesn't work, like for example, I haven't been to gym for two weeks because I've been so sick, but, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to pick myself up and go again. Whereas the easy thing to be would be, well, I failed. I'm not going to do it again. So you're bouncing back. Yeah, I like that. Come on then. What's yours? <laughs> oh, man, I knew you were going to ask me that. Oh, um, yes, you did. M- my intention for 2023 is more intention. <laughs> no, in all, in, in all seriousness, to, yeah. um, to be more intentional and to stay on routine. I have not been really good with routine. I don't know why. I think, I think maybe I know why. I think things have been so upside down the past couple of years, not just, you know, like the COVID piece of it's part of it. But then in my personal life, having, right, COVID happened, my mother died. Um, I got a divorce. I moved like three times. Uh, new job. I lost my theater, got a job, got a new job, met a guy. Married new him. co-host yeah a new co-host like <laughs> a lot of a lot of change in two years a lot of change and through that though I've been very successful so I'm I'm not unhappy about that but I am a high achiever and I know I could be I could be double the successful that I am right now with just a little more intentionality but I think I, I kind of just 
I took my foot off the pedal for a little while. Not in a bad way. I think I needed to. Yes. I think I, think I needed to. I think, you know, they talk about all the, you know, when you have life changes, like I had every major life change a person could have like in a six month window. Yeah. And you went with your body. Okay. Like you, you got yourself into a bit more of a relaxed state and many people being going through everything that you've been through, they could have ended up dead. They could have ended up in hospital. They could have ended yeah. up scarred, but you've come out shining. Yeah. And laughing, which yeah. is something to be proud of. You needed that. And I, again, I, I saw what was important in life and rested a little bit more than usual, even though I don't feel like I really rest. But <laughs> so, so my, my 2023 is about putting a little more gas on the pedal. Nice. Yeah. I like that. That's, I that's, like that. That's my plan because I think, um, that I'm in the right place and, and the right time. Yeah. I know some people who know me right now are like, what are you talking about? You're, you're always like fully maximized on the pedal, but no, I'm not. But you're talking about being intentional yeah. and that's realistic, right? You can carry on as you are being intentional. And the problem is most New Year's resolutions, because we did this last year, which means we're coming up to a whole year. Um, the problem is often with New Year's resolutions is that people set themselves resolutions they can't keep. Yeah. But I think that's sensible. I think that's it's adding something, a layer to what you're already doing, opposed yeah. to taking it all apart, which we're both doing. Yeah. So, And I think intentional um, can work really well with being okay with failing too. Right. Because yes. if you're intentional on something you're going to do and you also accept the fact that you might fail and you're okay with that, then the chance of you taking intention of being intentional increases. Yes. And you know what? One thing that I've just started doing, like in business, when you, when you lose a deal, like when I have a candidate who didn't take the job three days before they were supposed to start, I actually say, hey, thank you. I needed that kick <laughs> to get myself back on the sales train. Yep. And having that kind of mentality has been a game changer for me. I've done better this year than I ever thought I could because of that mentality. Yeah. That was a choice. Yeah. Good. Do we have any funny questions to wrap up the show? Oh, we'd always have a funny we question. We do? Oh my gosh. Of course we do. What is Would it? you rather? We're going back to would you rather. Okay. Would you rather? This is a bit of a funny one because it's Christmas and we play lots of music and carols and we have a good dance and we have a good sing. So I would hope, you ooh, rather? I hope Nian puts like Christmas hats on her head in our yeah. graphics but go on would you rather be forced to sing every time you hear music or dance every time you hear music oh like, all, like automatically dance really yeah why um yeah i have heard you sing at the karaoke i, I can see that i'm not really joking oh. <laughs> well, i mean got a, an awesome voice i have an awesome voice and Secretly, I'm practicing a song uh, for for a Christmas party where we do karaoke, and it's a song that I'm going to sing to David. So I'm excited Ooh. about it. Is it going to be something like "All I Want for yes, Christmas"? It is. It is. It is. <laughs> so I've been trying to practice it in a uh, key down because the key's a little high. But anyway, it is a bit high. It's, it's a, a bit, bit high. high. Yeah. So I'm trying to get the key down. But I would dance. Um, you have some moves. I've seen you. You've seen me dance. You've got that hip thing going. I like movement. I yeah. like movement. Yeah. Yeah. So movement, will, movement. You can guess what mine would be. Yours would be singing. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Every moment in life has a song attached to it. Yes. And if Every anybody, move. actually, I'm producing an album of you right now. It's all of your voice notes because Susanna sends me voice notes on WhatsApp. And um, a lot of times they're songs that she makes up. And she did that to me today. And I, I literally was like, I went to go pour another cup of coffee. I sat down. I'm like, I see the voice note and I start to take a swig of coffee and I hit the voice <laughs> note and the song you sang me almost made me spit out my coffee. It was so <laughs> More to come. I often take advantage of when I've got a bit of a cold because the voice sounds a bit more uh, sexy. I don't sexy. know. Sexy. Whatever you want. Sexy. <laughs> well, um, uh, if you celebrate Christmas, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, 
yeah. from the women your mother warned you about. We hope that you have an awesome holiday, but we'll be back next week and we'll be wrapping up the year. I don't know. Maybe we'll talk about some of our favorite things this year. Um, One of my favorite 12 things. days of Christmas. Yep. Susanna is my favorite thing. Oh. <laughs> Susanna joined the show this year. So, um, so, so the, We'll, we'll see you next week and I hope you have a great holiday. Thanks for listening to The Women Your Mother Warned You About, brought to you by Sales Gravy. And hey, take advantage of the time being down right now. If you can't get a hold of prospects, which by the way, is just kind of a BS excuse, go take a class at Sales Gravy. That's what you should do. Utilize your time right now at salesgravy.university. There are almost 200 courses to choose from. So much more now. So much yeah. more. And you know what? If you're looking for a last minute gift idea, that would be an incredible gift for the salesperson in your life. Go to salesgravy.university to get an all access pass. Uh, that is my that's my final holiday last minute gift giving ideas for you. Susanna, have a lovely Christmas. And have a lovely Christmas too. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. <laughs> we're out of here. We Bye, Warner. <laughs> yes, yeah, sing it. No, we're out of here. Bye. You have some moves. I've seen you. You got that hip thing going. I like movement. <laughs>